Hey, what's going on everybody? Today we're going to be taking a look at the Cisco CBS 350 24 port with 4 gig uplinks. This is one of Cisco's new small business uh, line of switches. These CBS models replaced the SG models, if anybody's familiar with them. Um, I pretty much call any of these a Cisco small business, and I actually hate them. And it has nothing to do with it being a bad switch or anything. It's just I am used to catalysts. And if you've ever worked on catalysts and you're really used to what I call real Cisco iOS, these are familiar enough to make you feel comfortable and that you're working on an actual Cisco device, but they are dumbed down and different enough to just annoy the absolute crap out of you. So there's a lot of features that these either have or don't have that are different from catalysts that just kind of behave differently and in my experience just irk anybody who uh, is used to working on catalysts. So they will never live up to a catalyst in my book. Um, I say that I hate them all the time. However, they are really solid switches once uh, they're going and they're really competitive with everybody else in their space. So you can't really fault them. It's just kind of a personal thing with me that it, it's not a catalyst, so it is not good enough. <laughs> but anyways, let's get into this one. I'm just going to go through the uh, very basic setup. Um, I've set up a ton of these in the past few years, and there's a few quirks to it um, that you pretty much always run into when setting these up. So I kind of made my own checklist or my own way to uh, set them up from scratch, which I think is a lot quicker and gets you around a lot of uh, the little annoying stuff that you can run into with these. So obviously the first step is just to take it out of the box and plug it in. Now this specific model does not have any fans, so it is completely silent when you plug it in. Here is just a really quick uh, audio clip of me plugging it in. Did you hear that? No, you didn't because there's nothing to hear. I actually put the microphone down right um, above it because I wanted to record how loud it was going to be because the last model that I uh, recorded was actually extremely loud, but I didn't realize that uh, I grabbed a different model switch. So this one actually is completely silent and it can do that because of these huge uh, heat sinks on the back or these fins. Uh, now these are managed through a web interface. Um, that is one of the perks, I guess you could say, of the small business line is that they actually have a GUI that is usable and most of your configuration is done in there. However, when we actually get into setting this up, um, we are going to initially start in the command line and I'll explain why uh, after we get into it. So first things first, I'm going to grab my USB to serial cable and we are going to console into this and do all of the initial setup before actually hitting the web interface. So just plug in your console cable over here into the console port and we'll switch over to our computer where we'll bring up a putty session and we need to figure out which uh, port our serial connector is on. Um, if you're familiar with console cables, you probably already know how to do this, but just open device manager and look for the area called ports, com and LPT and we should have a serial to COM port. And it looks like I actually have two of them for some reason. So that's COM5 and COM6. So let's see which one is the real one. And we'll open up Putty here, select serial, and we'll start with COM5 and we'll see what we get. And we press open and we press enter a couple times and looks like that was the right one. All right, and now we can just log in with the uh, default Cisco, Cisco and here we've already hit the first problem with these uh, small business switches. If you notice, if I type in Cisco and say I made a mistake, um, you can't backspace, at least not by default with the default putty settings. So to get around this, we're gonna exit out of this session, reopen putty, set that to COM5, and we're going to go to the keyboard settings over here under terminal. And we're gonna change the backspace key from control whatever to control H. This is um, how you get around the backspace issue with these small business switches because the default setting of PuTTY just does not allow you to backspace. And if we click open and we go into our COM port again, we try to log in with username Cisco and say we misspell it, we can now actually backspace. So Cisco Cisco, 
and it's going to ask us to create a new username and a password. Now, at this point, we cannot reuse the username Cisco. Um, if we try that, it'll say credentials uh, failed, cannot edit, add or delete the default user. So if you really want to use Cisco as your username, which I really don't recommend, but if you do, you need to change it to like admin first, and then we can go in later and change it back to Cisco, but it won't let you do that straight out of the box. So let's create a new user, admin, give it a new password. And I just tried to give it a password of just straight password and it failed. So you have to use a password that is at least somewhat complex and it can't have a, a dictionary word in it, which makes things a little bit um, annoying when you're trying just to demo the equipment. And now that I'm sitting down to actually show this, I didn't really realize how um, insane the password requirements were. Uh, as you can see by this full wall of text, none of the passwords I typically use are even accepted. So the reason that I haven't really hit this very much is because I typically use a password generator and creates uh, insane passwords. I just wasn't going to use that here because I typically don't set insane passwords on uh, equipment that I'm making a video on but let's go ahead and search for norton password generator we'll go ahead and go to this site and just have it uh create us a ridiculous password here i'll go ahead and copy the first one and we'll go back to putty enter our username not cisco admin right click to paste that in enter right click paste and now we are finally in our switch so first thing is first and that is to enter configuration mode uh, conf t and we're going to change the host name. That is just host name, whatever we want to call it. So for this one, um, it's going to be just core dash uh, zero one, because this is going to be a core switch for somewhere. But the naming scheme that I usually follow is location dash switch dash uh, number, because there could be more than one. So really, I would do core switch zero one. And now that we've set our host name, we're going to set the management IP. Now out of the box, it has a default management IP on VLAN 1 of 192.168.1.254. And this is really the main reason that I do this through the command line first, because I've found that setting this IP in the GUI is a complete pain in the butt. Um, I might be doing it wrong, but typically I have to create a secondary VLAN interface, give that an IP, and then delete the primary. So by consoling into the device, we can just go ahead and set that IP, no problem. So we're going to go into interface VLAN one. And if you are actually going to use your own management VLAN, which is other than VLAN one, now is the time to create that. But I'm just going to put the IP on VLAN one. I'll go ahead and do IP address 192.168.1.10. And then you put the subnet mask off to the side there. And we've changed our management IP. Then the next command I usually do is IP default gateway. Set that, 192.168.1.1. And what this command does is it allows the switch to know where to send traffic um, that's coming from another network. So if you actually did have a management VLAN, say you're accessing it from a computer on 192.168.10 whatever, if you try to hit this switch and it doesn't have the default gateway configured, it doesn't know uh, where to send that traffic. So if you've ever set up a switch and then tried to remotely manage it later, and it just seems like it will not respond to you, unless you are directly connected to it, uh, this is probably the reason why. Now the next commands that I do is just enable SSH. Uh, by default, at least on the SG uh, series switches, it was disabled by default. So we're gonna do IP SSH server. And then we're also gonna do IP SSH password dash auth. This is a pretty important command, at least um, in my mind. Because if you ever have to SSH to these switches, if you don't enter this command, you will get prompted for the username twice. So if you are familiar with uh, dealing with these, if you've ever SSH to one of them and putty pops up username, you put in your username and then it just re-asks you for the username again. It's because uh, this command wasn't in there. And then I also like to set the domain name while we are here. And I'm just going to use the example domain, mydomain.com. Next, we are going to set the uh, SSH timeout periods. By default, the timeout period on these are, is set very low. It seems like I'm getting kicked out every five minutes. And actually, it, it may just be in my head, but I swear even using these commands doesn't even change that fact. So I do it anyway, even though it might not even do anything. So we're going to go into line SSH, 
and we're going to do exec timeout 30 and that sets the SSH timeout to 30 minutes of inactivity. And then along with that, we're going to do IP HTTP timeout policy 1800 HTTPS only. And that extends the timeout policy for the actual uh, web GUI session, which we will get to in a minute. Now this next command is probably uh, not recommended from a security standpoint, and that is no, or not no, passwords aging zero. So this sets it to where your passwords never expire. Um, for me, I have set timelines on like when switch passwords should be updated. It's more of a internal policy thing, not a managed policy on the switch type of thing. And when you have a network with like 10 or 20 switches in it, keeping up with different passwords for every switch to me is just too much of a pain. I would rather disable password aging on all of them, set all the passwords for them the same, and then update those passwords every 90 days or something. Now, obviously that is not recommended for security. It is way more secure to have different passwords for every device and also way more secure for them to age out automatically. But this is just something I do when I set up my switches. And I mistyped that, it's actually passwords aging zero, not password aging zero. Now, the next section of commands that I do are related to NTP because I don't think it's actually set up properly uh, by default. This may just be left over from some older SG switches that I saw once upon a time, but I still do these commands anyway. And that is setting a DNS server by using IP name server. And we'll just use Google. Setting the switch to do IP domain lookup just so that it can actually resolve uh, domain names and then setting the NTP servers. And I like to use Google and Windows, so we're gonna do SNTP server time.google.com and SNTP server time.windows.com. And then a very important command is to actually uh, set the clock time zone. Uh, for me, I'm in central time zone, so I'm gonna do CST minus six, and we get some output saying that the time zone was changed. And I'm also going to set the daylight savings time, and that is clock summertime web recurring USA. Now, obviously, set the time zone for your specific time zone. And then lastly, we are going to enable SNTP unicast client by doing SNTP unicast client enable. And that turns on our NTP. Now, at this point, we're going to do some port configurations. Uh, the baseline at this point is pretty much done, but I like to keep going in the command line just because I'm used to Catalyst and I'm more comfortable in here, and I feel like I can still do even the port configurations faster through the console than I can through the web interface. So first, I'm going to identify my uplink ports. Typically, that's like the last four ports on the switch or even just the last one port. But if I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to be doing with the switch, I like to just do the last four anyway. So I'm going to exit out of line mode and go into interface range. And we're going to do GI, uh, I think, 1022 to 24. Bad parameter value. All right, these uh, interfaces must be designated differently. Yeah, it's just 1 through 28. There is no 1 slash whatever. So interface GI 22 to 24. These are gonna be my uplinks. And when I have uplinks, I like to hard code them. I don't like for smart ports uh, to take over. And on these small business switches, they absolutely love their smart ports. All of the ports are smart ports by default. And what that means is that if you plug this switch into another switch, the port automatically recognizes that it's a switch and will convert it to a trunk port. And there's all kinds of other customizations you can do with it. Like you can have a OUI table of MAC addresses and say like, we want this vendor to go to this VLAN and it'll recognize it and basically reconfigure the port around that. Now that is something that I don't like on my uplinks. So I hard code them and I disable smart ports. So for these ports 22 to 24, we're gonna do switch port mode trunk. And if I have specific VLANs that I wanna pass, I will do switch port trunk allow VLAN and only those specific VLANs. So one, five, 10, if I want only those. And then I'm gonna do no macro auto smart port and that disables the entire uh, smart port application entirely. And then as always, it's good to put a description on there. Now I'll just put 
uplink. And then now we'll go ahead and exit out of the interface config mode. And the second to last thing that I like to do here is definitely uh, probably easier done in the GUI, but it is setting the voice VLAN. So we're gonna do voice VLAN state disabled first, and then we're gonna change the state back to auto triggered. And then we're gonna set the VLAN ID using voice VLAN ID. Typically I use VLAN 100 for my voice VLAN. So that is what we're gonna put in here. And it's gonna say that it's going to cause the switch to advertise the administrative voice VLAN as a static. So this actually is a little bit dangerous. Um, these small business switches will actually pass the voice VLAN down through CDP and whatnot to other switches. So if this was already plugged into a network and we actually had a different voice VLAN configured, setting this could actually pass the wrong VLAN to all the other switches. It's almost like VTP. So if you are changing the voice VLAN, especially in this manner, uh, make sure that you have it right before you hit enter, just in case it decides to tell all its friends about it. But we're gonna go ahead and click yes to create voice VLAN 100. And then we can do a couple show commands if we want to verify that. And that's show voice VLAN local and show voice VLAN type auto. There we go. I misspelled it. Now, at this point, the very last thing I would do is actually update the username and password. However, it had us do that at the very beginning. So I really have no need to do that. But typically, I would go in here and do the whole username, admin, privilege, 15 password and then type in my new password but i'm not going to do that because i already have a uh, secure password on here but the absolute very last thing you should always do is a do right so this is to save the configuration we have not saved anything at this point so if uh, the switch just rebooted before we saved we would lose everything we did but at this point we are pretty much good to plug the switch in and if we want to bring up the gui all we have to do is just connect our computer to any of the lan ports or we could even connect it up to the network as long as our IP scheme was correct, like that 192.168.1.10. But I'm just going to move my cable from the console port over to any of the LAN ports, and we'll access the uh, GUI from here. And my network here is actually not 192.168.1. anything, so I have to manually set this uh, USB adapter that I'm connecting directly to the switch with. So I'm going to give it an IP of 192.168.1.5. And I really don't have to give it a default gateway since it's directly connected. So we'll go ahead and hit OK. Bring up our web browser and go straight to 192.168.1.10. And here is our switch management interface. And we can just go ahead and log in with that username and password we created. And here is the lovely new Cisco CBS uh, interface. And you can see some of the changes that we made in the CLI. Showing up here, specifically under status and uh, statistics, we have our host name, course which one, showing up here. And if we go down to the smart port section, we can take a look at those. Um, actually, let's switch our view up here in the top from basic to advanced. And here we can actually see the smart port interface settings. Uh, you can see that they have auto smart port, but those four that we uh, did, or well, I guess I'm really bad at math. We only did three of them, 22 to 24. Um, those are actually disabled because we manually disabled them through the command line. Now, just one more thing I'm going to show you in the GUI here, the IPv4 configuration. This was one of the things that I uh, always struggled with. And maybe I'm doing this wrong, but if I check this and I go into edit, I actually can't edit the IP address. And I don't understand why. So what I've always had to do in the past is actually add another interface here on another network, give it a static IP address, connect to that IP, and then go in and delete this VLAN one and re-add it with the actual IP that I want. So that is what I really wanted to get around um, by doing the command line. But that is pretty much it. Um, some things that you might want to do after you've got this switch baselined and set up is obviously add your different VLANs if you have them. So you'll go into the VLAN settings, add, we'll do like VLAN ID 50 for wireless, go ahead and click apply. And then to assign that to different ports, we can go down to port VLAN management or port VLAN membership, sorry. Select uh, the port that we wanna be a part of that. Go up to join VLAN. 
And then we can set the access VLAN ID to 50 if we want, or if we want to make that a trunk, we can define the other VLANs, 50 and 100 or whatever. But this is where you do all of your uh, VLAN configurations for the ports. And there's actually like three different places that you can do almost the same thing. There's the port VLAN membership page, there's the port to VLAN page, which is basically just the exact same thing in a different way. We can go to VLAN 50 and then scroll down to our port we want and make it untagged. That does the same thing as making it an access port in the other menu. And I know I said that there was three places to do it. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure if there is a third place. I do know under interface settings, you can change the VLAN mode between access and trunk and general and all that. But that is pretty much just my uh, take on how to set this up from scratch. Um, if you do look up documentation, typically it'll have you start with this web interface, which as I said, if you want to change the management IP, there's some wizardry that has to go on in that. But the reason that I go through the command line is a lot of those other commands like the SSH uh, password off command. I don't actually even know where to find that in the GUI. Uh, setting the SSH timeouts and all that is like buried down here in security. Um, to disable password aging, you have to be in advanced mode, and then that's also down here under security somewhere. Uh, to me, it's just a lot harder to find these settings in the actual user interface than it is to just type them in to the console. And I know that a lot of people don't like memorize these commands, and it may actually take longer to find which command you want to put in and use the console that way, but... For some of us who are trained on traditional Cisco equipment, the command line is definitely the way to go to get these set up initially. But when I'm actually managing these after they've been deployed, I do actually use the GUI for basically everything else. The command line is just my way of getting it set up initially so that I don't have to waste time trying to find settings in all these menus. But anyways, it's been a while since I've done a Cisco video. And I just happened to have one of these lying around, figured I would go through kind of my take on the initial configuration, and hopefully you learned something from it. And, um, if you've got any suggestions, put it in the comments below. And as always, happy networking.